is Dr. Karina Lopez with Vitalist Healing Traditions. And today I'm with a wonderful, wonderful friend and colleague that is dear to my heart, Dr. Hannah Gale. Now, Dr. Hannah, Hannah Gale is a naturopathic physician and a licensed acupuncturist. She is also a Waldorf, she has been a Waldorf teacher for 15 years and arguably, I would say even 25 years through her <laughs> studies and with her son and, and all that she has learned and endured. And I, we have had conversations throughout the years about so many different things and, and helping heal so many people. And then I had my baby boy and Hannah has been instrumental to my life. And we've had these beautiful conversations that I would love to share with everyone. So hi, Hannah. Dr. Hi. Gail, I'm sorry. <laughs> I'm so used to Hannah. So, so, so well, no, Dr. feel free. <laughs> Just call me Hannah and I'll call you Karina. And, and so, you know, they, let's, you know. <laughs> but because they were talking to moms and I, I want, and as a mother and, uh, a you know I, I just I, I always seek your advice so I'm going to call you Dr. Gale and okay all know. right <laughs> I'll call you I guess I guess I'll call you Dr. Lopez <laughs> which is wonderful I, we met as students before we did that so we we're in that it. habit <laughs> right right so it's habit so yeah. so today we're talking about some of the challenges with with parents with children especially with feeling secure in an un insecure world at this point, and and I wanted to to ask you, tell me about that. So, um, you know, it, it, generally speaking, I I uh, I have witnessed, you know, through the raising of my son in in a, a Waldorf community, and also the um, you know the teaching of a class that I took through as a class teacher from first through eighth grade. The, so all of the students that I watched grow up on a day-to-day -day basis for those eight years, they've grown up now. They're uh, a year older than my son. And then there are many children that I taught um, either when, when I worked in parent-child or, um, you know, as, a, as an, an early childhood, or then kids that I tutored uh, who, were, who were being homeschooled, who their parents had hired me to uh, you know, give lessons in the Waldorf curriculum um, when I was already in school for uh, acupuncture and, and, and naturopathic medicine. Um, and then before, when my son was very little, I also worked for a homeschool cooperative. So that's a lot of kids, plus the kids right. I've seen in practice. And, and um, you know, I couldn't endorse the Waldorf curriculum more you know I, what i sort of always say is you know that not everything is always executed perfectly but if you're going to try to do something you want to have the thing you're trying to do be a really good thing you know what i mean you want the, the intention and the and the the intelligence of the recommendations and of what it's founded in to be really um you know substantial and and based on uh, you know, uh, on all of the, the best um, aggregations of knowledge we have about child development and education and, um, you know, what makes an intelligent human being. So I really feel that Waldorf education has that as a, as a gestalt. But, you know, what's interesting is that, you know, being in Greece, where I am now, there's, there's a Waldorf school about four hours away from me, and here I am in the mountains of Pelion, and it's just fantastic. But you have a, been able, you know, with our conversations to show me the interplay between health and, and also sort of these Waldorf education pillars. So I wanted, now that you're, you know, you're a physician for quite a number of years now and, and having that background as a Waldorf teacher, how would you then look at a child who is in need for security, is yeah. in need for that, that comfort in such a world where there's so much fear. How do you approach it now that you have these two didactic sort of hats on that you, that you hold? Yeah, yeah and so um, I guess 
the way I want to start talking about it is that um, in anthroposophy, which is sort of this, the, the what is called termed a spiritual science, right, which is such an interesting concept, right, science that is mediated through um, sort of more, a more spiritual awareness that we're, you know, we're, we're not just trying to weigh, measure, and quantify, we're also... Right. Uh, paying attention to connections between things and metaphors and um, mythical elements and and how things really are hitting us on all levels of our humanity as you know in, including our spiritual and soulful and emotional and living selves. So um, in in anthroposophy there is twelve senses, not just six, and really even in the in the physical world. Uh, we don't even think of, uh, uh, oh, sorry, yeah, of five senses, and <laughs> that's six. six is the, the imaginary ESP one, um, that there is, there are actually two additional senses now thought of physiologically, and I actually learned this from the book you recommended, Carrie Mullen's book, um, yes, was so seminal for you. You got me to read that, and so I learned this from him in that book. But he talks about there's this sense of falling in in weight. The weight of falling is a sense, and time is actually a sense. So this idea of there being these sort of extra senses that are actual real senses is in the regular scientific world, not just in anthroposophy. But anthroposophy talks about this a sense of life you know, which we can kind of think of as like the base of the um, Abraham Maslow's pyramid of self-actualization, like what you need, like, you know, basically Maslow says you can't really develop yourself um, in terms of refining your desires or, uh, you know, self-actualization is what the pyramid is about if you don't have these basics. And, and uh, Waldorf and anthroposophy really say the same thing, that you must have a, a robust sense of life. Your sense of life must be healthy before you can develop any of your other senses. So, you know, my son, when he was born, he jaundiced really badly and he was in the hospital and had to be under UV lights and he couldn't latch on. That's kind of how he got in that situation to begin with. And I was having to pump and, and um, you know, give him a bottle and then trying to break wait, that. Wait, wait, say something really quickly. Sure. I, I just, it's interesting that you said that your son joined us because he couldn't latch on and he couldn't receive the breast milk mm -hmm. to help him, you know, die process yeah. Yeah. Well, to live, but also to process the Billy Rubin, correct? I mean, that's correct. That's that is, it, it, it has to really move through you, the Billy Rubin, and come out as fecal matter. Right. And if you're right. not nursing, it doesn't, um, it doesn't create that peristaltic, uh, parasympathetic um, simulation. So, so can I just say something? Can I just say that I remember when I had my baby and my baby, I, my baby was born a little premature. He was born at three, 36 weeks, as you know. And I remember we had to be transported from our home, our beautiful home birth. We were forced to be transported to the hospital. But at the hospital, they were so averse to me actually breastfeeding my baby. They instead wanted me to pump milk so that I can quantify how much milk there was. And of course I didn't, and I kept breastfeeding my baby. And they even told me that if I breastfed, I would put my baby at risk yeah. Yeah. and for more jaundice. So I just think that what you said is so pertinent for mothers to understand that in reality, the truth is by breastfeeding, you're allowing your baby to better process their Billy Rubin. So, yes. and, and and not only that, that not whole parasympathetic, uh, you know, sti stimulation that allows things to pass down the GI and out. And and yeah. and then what sense is then created? With yeah. That? So that's where I was trying to get it. Another time, we should have a conversation just on this because there's so much there to unpack. Sure. 
but um but but my my son you know we did successfully get him on at about three weeks but i always sort of felt that he had uh more of an issue in that sense of life in feeling secure because it had been really touch and go but that happens to a lot of kids so you know th this um uh, you know, this uh, early traumas that affect the sense of life are, are, I think, quite common. So I really felt like I had to do more to protect him when he was in his early childhood, because um, whenever he would get hungry, it would, there would like a panic would set it like, like he had more vulnerability to right. anything that made him feel uh, suboptimal in terms of um, nutrition because it, it it his sense of life that's if it's a sense right was already challenged. Um, so I really thought a lot about how to protect him. You know that's kind of why I was so drawn to Waldorf and why I um, you know dived so deeply in it and, and became such a, a a believer in it because. Waldorf really says that, um, you know, in addition to, you know, the nourishment that you need from your mother and the warmth that you're getting from your mother, the love, the safety, the emotion, the emotional safety that your needs are being met by someone who understands you and can respond to your needs. Sorry. It happens. <laughs> um, uh, that, you know, really children are taking in so much through their senses that are actually, like Steiner talks about really forming their organs. Your, and, and we can think about that in, you know, in, in modern medical terms, in terms of epigenetics, you know, so, so many um, choices for life are are being formed by these epigenetic processes as the child's early experiences are causing certain genes to be, um, you know, to be soft coded on or off based on the potentiality of their inherited genes and then uh, the, the adaptation to the circumstances, right? So if I could just take a second, just to- Sure, that's kind of complicated, but- Right, sure. I, think, I think that, that those, are, those are complicated processes. And so, you know, with epigenetics, just to kind of cover what that is, is essentially thinking about how your environment affects the genes that you were born with. Correct. And so what, what they're finding now is that you could actually transfer very, very either traumatic or wonderful and beautiful experiences through your life. And there's some interesting studies that show mothers during 9-11 and post after they had their babies. Now they were not pregnant during 9-11, but later when they followed these mothers and they had gotten pregnant and had a baby, they found that the babies had higher cortisol levels than other babies, so higher stress levels. And so I think that that's a really nice example of how that feeling of security, as we're speaking of today, really permeates a human being, even with trauma in their ancestry. So now going back to what you said, you said that thinking about epigenetics, thinking about environment, thinking about what happened to your son, where suddenly, you know, he was in his mother's arms, but then developed the jaundice where he was then taken to the hospital, could have felt a form of maybe detachment that scared him, correct? Sure. Yeah, and, so and, that, and also the, uh, you know, he, he wasn't able to get nourishment. So mm -hmm. his blood sugar had dropped, like he, his life was threatened by not being able to nurse, and you know, which thank God, you know, we, we took him to a clinic and, and uh, my midwife in the meantime had brought like goat milk. I had gotten him on one time. I had gotten him to nurse well um, the night uh, he was born in the afternoon and 2.30, 2.40. I'd gotten him to nurse once that evening, but he was born very thin. So he didn't have a lot of reserves anyway, like a lot of babies have more fat on them. He did not. So, you know, I, I probably have some other, some food absorption issues. So, you know, I'm not sure exactly why that happened. I've never really dove into that. 
without even blaming ourselves. I mean, just thinking about, you know, how, how you have this beautiful baby and already he's having some trouble digesting life and, yeah. you know, perhaps We're getting enough like, life, you know, right, right. You're digesting, yeah. getting enough, being able to receive life. Yeah. And, and perhaps maybe there's some transgenerational issues that you have in your ancestry where it was difficult for you to receive life, receive love, and, and who knows? And what's beautiful is that when we think about things, we don't have to blame ourselves. Instead, we can say, wow, this is the karmic reality that, that, our, that your son chose to deal with to further your generation. Sure, yeah. So it's beautiful, yeah. beautiful manifestation. So then how then- but It was you... my job to try to make him then feel safer. And so right. I turned to um, these Waldorf principles about, you know, feeding the whole child through all their senses, which meant, you know, what they're hearing and looking at and touching, that those mm -hmm. are going to uh, have exponential effects on their sense of well-being, sense of safety, sense of life. And so... Um, when Percy, you know, was, you know, six months old or something like that, I began my teacher training, um, you know, and, and then at, in Chicago at the uh, Chicago Waldorf School, there was a, there's a teacher training there. And so I learned how to, you know, um, play music that, um, you know, that I sang songs to him. I used a lot of, uh, early nursery rhymes and you know clapping games and lap games you know and and um in a very conscious way and I did my best to create an you know uh, an environment that um he could explore on his own that had really um natural things that had a, a warm soul warming quality so um you know, I did like, I did, you know, make him a doll, you know, <laughs> and, and, um, and my mother, my mother-in-law got him like this really cool Waldorf doll and a doll bed. Um, and he got into it and, you know, like all little kids do when he was about 18 months old. Um, I, I, that, I yeah, sorry. You, said, you said that you were able to evolve or grow your or burgeon rather your 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 child's senses through soul warming um centered objects noises yeah um and and love and just yeah. to think of, of you making that doll and putting your soul in that with natural fibers which yeah. he could touch and and I, mean, I had to knit it I had to learn how to knit <laughs> there you go so you <laughs> learned how to knit and on top of it, you know, you, you went through this beautiful process. And so, yeah. so, so tell me, tell me more about what the senses bring to, to children. And what are some examples of things that parents can do to allow their children to feel more secure in the world through soul warming activities, objects, etc. Yeah. So, um, you know, one, you know, it's like, it's hard when you're, when you're, you don't have a young child in the house, you forget some of these songs and nursery rhymes so quickly, like you actually have to go get them again or remember them because they, <laughs> they sink back into you in this very primal place that's hard to bring to consciousness again. It's just a, it's that place of early childhood, you know, that's in all of us. Um, sure. So like an, an example is, which I've done with like other people, I still do with other people's kids. So I remember it. Um, there's this little song about uh, five little ducks that go out to play over the hills and far away. Mama duck says quack, quack, quack. And then it's, you know, four little ducks come running back. And then you repeat it, you know, four little ducks run out to play over the hills and far away. Mama duck says quack, quack, quack three little ducks came running back, you know, and you just using your fingers, <laughs> you're creating the characters of these little sweet animals. And um, the child plays with you because they 
see it they suspend their disbelief like we all do when we watch a movie or a play or something and they imagine your little fingers are the little ducks and you know and that you're the mom and dad and the child lives into the picture that you're creating for them and you're both um you're uh, uh, like playing is like it takes an agreement it's like if we're going to play together and I'm going to be, you know, the mommy and you're going to be the baby or, you right. know, or whatever, we have to make an agreement to that. And then we both act that out. You know what I mean? Right. So even in that little song, the child and you are sort of making an agreement and the child will listen to you. And as they get older, then they'll do it back. You know what I mean? And you you enter into it with them. Um, so the the movement of things right that a child can connect their eyes that they're following with a, a living picture that has sensory um, warmth to it that um, enters the child in many different ways steiner talks a lot about the importance of like toys that move so he talks about like you know uh things that like will, it, you know, the little ducks on the tray that go around or toys that will, that have movement quality, where you pull a string and something, right. you know, that those things, those living things that, that they delight children, right? Children are delighted by movement and that delight um, and the, and things moving through time and space have this effect of awakening in you the sense of life because life is movement through time you know it, it's events moving through time your finger is moving the ducks going through this little journey so that's you know i know that's kind of complicated it's a little simple nursery rhyme is is really so profound you know <laughs> it's just really right. Right. My no mind. it's so profound and i think that that brings that that beautiful you know enlivening enlivening of the senses it's it's just tremendous yeah hannah i just i i what i think that i think that your voice and what you have to share is so important because you know just knowing that parents could bring back their children and that feeling of security by not purchasing these electronic toys that speak through them through something else but instead through their voice through what they make, through what they allow their children to touch that's substantial, that's natural, really feeds into the senses. And I'd like to have more of these conversations with you. And today was kind of- Before we sign okay. off, can I just add, can I, I just want yes. to say one more thing. And because I feel um, that if we didn't, if I didn't touch on this, I, I would be remiss. So. I just want to talk about the importance of animal forces in general, you know, um, wool in particular, like, and this quality of the sense of life, it, it requires a sense of warmth to be engendered. And so wool in particular has these warming forces of the animal having made this protective insulating substance um, that holds warmth and it has a particular relationship to children you know lambs have a particular warmth and quality you know that children love and so one of the things we do in Waldorf education for children like Percy that are, have a little deprivation in the sense of life is we give them wool to wear um, and and you know so I, when I would tell parents to do this, you know, buy these German yeah. made or uh, Swiss made or whatever there are these uh, wool t-shirts and, and sure. you know, they can have wool leggings, right? For your children, it will help them feel safe and warm. They're like, but it itches, it itches. <laughs> and, you know, and the, and I'm not saying there might not be some children that are super hyper, sure, you, know, sure. a derma, you know, have a derm dermic reaction, but the little bit of itching that wool has is actually really beneficial because it's, you know, it's, uh, it's raising circulation a little bit in the body. And that's well, part of 
you know, you these are anti-allergenic. They are there's so many medicinal properties to wearing wool. I mean, yeah. even with holding in the heat of a child so that they prevent, you know, any cold or this or that. I mean, yeah. in, the, in the Caribbean, just as a folklore remedy, you know, you you have the, the child wear a wool hat. Really? And it helps with, you know, asthma. It helps with a lot of different aspects. I mean, when my son was, you know, sleeping on a little lambskin when he was first born every night. And I feel like that really helped comfort him. So there's so much to that. So thank you for that addition, Hannah. And I look forward to so many more conversations. And how can people reach you? To, to, um, to so you? I, you know, you can, uh, you can, I'm, I have a company called Three Hairs Healing. And there's a website, which is, you know, you can look me up at Dr. Hannah Gale at Three Hairs Healing. Wonderful. Thank you so much, Hannah. And thank you. thank you everyone for listening. And of course, you know, we're at Violet's Healing Traditions, Traditions.com, And we look forward to hearing from you soon. Thank you and have a wonderful day. Thank you. Bye. Bye. <laughs>